Now, we move on to Maxwell's gravity dilemma. Maxwell, by his own admission, had no clue how gravity works. And here's what he said. I don't want to read the whole thing, but it says, I'll just read the bottom here. As I am unable to understand in what way a medium can possess such properties as, as in other words, being able to suck things in, <laughs> that I can't go any further in this direction for searching for a cause of gravity. So Maxwell himself says, I, got, I don't have a clue. <laughs> next, next one. But, but interestingly enough, Maxwell, it is Maxwell to whom we have, whom we get the answers uh, for the cause of gravity. Mathematically. Mathematically, not, not, uh, not uh, philosophically. Okay, because uh, from Maxwell, we understand that the, the energy of a medium decreases in the pressure of the presence of matter, which seems a little strange. And how does that happen? Because it, it comes about from a mathematics called the, the calculus of variation and created by Lagrange. Applying those, that mathematics to Maxwell's electromagnetic fields does create nonlinear gradients of gravitational potentials. In other words, it can create suction. Okay? And so we can get that thank, thanks to Maxwell, although Maxwell himself really didn't have a clue. So interesting. Let's go on. So Maxwell was a success and a failure both. He was a genius, and yet he didn't get us there. Uh, he and, and his main fault was he uh, he subscribed to a motionless static ether. That there's this this this, press, this stuff that's out there, but it's not doing anything. And it is the dynamics which causes the compressibly the, the, the compressive. Yeah, okay. All right. So he didn't answer how kinetic energy can decrease. How can you get kinetic energy to decrease in the presence of matter. And that's, that's uh, but you know what? He's a pretty good guy, just to say. <laughs> Let's go on. All right, ether density between bodies. Um, this is, again, a matter of definition. The center of mass. Well, okay, I, okay. I, I know what we're talking about here. Uh, if we have a system, let's say it's two, two objects of mass, the center point, the center of mass point, is an interesting point in terms of the fields because each of these are in, have their own fields going out, but the center point is actually a point of zero density. You see that even though even though there's great, um, so it's a very interesting point because you're getting you're getting you're getting contributions from this direction and contributions from that direction that precisely cancel each other at the center of mass. So it's a very interesting point in terms of the field. Am I right? That's what you were saying. That, that's what Newton said. And, and that's what that, that's that's so it's the fulcrum of the gradient fields. Is everybody following? In other words, you, you've got this field over here that's surrounding this point, and you got this field over here. You add them up vectorially, and you're going to get a total field, which at this point in the middle is, is zero. You mean like the pressure? It's like shadow. Uh, well, you can draw the, 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 the field lines end up going like what part? Excuse me. They end up going like this. You know what I'm saying? And in the middle point, there's there's nothing. It's just sort of it's spreading up in there. Well, uh, it's, yeah. it's not nothing. It's well, it's a zero. But it's losing ether pressure. Yes. Each, uh, the pressure external pressure, pressure and, and the internal function mm -hmm. from the two elements. So the the interesting it's moving <laughs> them closer. Not yet. Can you? Okay. So the interesting point about this is that that point is actually the point of greatest rarefaction. In other words, not, not the point of greatest density, but actually the point of least density is right in the center. It's a surprising thing. But actually, when, you, when you've added vectorally, that is what you get. Well, that was the problem of Maxwell. He couldn't imagine how his ether right. can decrease energy. Sure. How can it lose density right. sure. when it's a, a random motion? Yes. So, Dick, what, what uh, Rado recognizes is that the card sun vortex, going all the way back to the card, actually did recognize this, this issue. And it's an important one that we need to address, even though there were flaws otherwise. Uh, so, so, then he goes on to say, state that there is an ethereal vortex around the sun. So, so Descartes was right, even though wrong in mathematics. Okay, next. All right, the spiral galaxy, then uh, this ties into what we were just talking about, that, that the galaxies are, in fact, spiral. The first one was discovered in 1927, and this is just a picture of that. So we can uh, go on. Okay, uh, and I'm very sorry, but I did not get further than this, because uh, this is there where, at the point where he gets to the actual derivation, and I did not, I have about four more, five more pages of notes, and I didn't get time to put them in here, I'm sorry. But we're, almost, we're actually 20 minutes over time anyway, so I'll, I'll close it off as best I can with what I have. 
Um, he defines a mean collision free path as the average di di uh, distance between collisions. So we've got these little ether particles that are bouncing into each other as sort of like billiard balls, I guess. And they, these, uh, this, the, this distance is going to decrease with density as these things get less, as there's less of them in space, you're not going to hit it, you're not going to run into each other as much. And they're also going to decrease with ether on size. As the things are smaller, they're less likely to pass into each other. If they're bigger, they're going to hit more often. Does that make sense? So ether on size and the density, ether on per volume, those are the things that are going to cause the decrease in the, the mean free path length. If we can increase the mean free path length in, in particular directions, then we're going to get a motion in that direction, an acceleration in that direction. Everybody following that argument? Each individual ethon has, now this is the important, I think the, really the guts of the whole theory right here. The, each individual ethon has a preferred direction for the longest, CF stands for collision free. The longest collision free path is going to be, there is some direction in which that thing can go, which is going to statistically give it the longest path. Is everybody following that? Okay. It's, and it's, that direction. If you use the uh, concept of suction, yeah. then, then you can imagine that each mass sucking in the ether, which means that heat drops are disappearing in mass from the isotropy. Sure. So there is an anisotropic uh, uh, forms between the two objects. But, but you have to also realize that it's not the two objects uh, attract each other, but there is one object with a general vertex around it mm -hmm. and smaller pieces like planets are orbiting around it. Okay. So, so they don't have an, a straight radial path between each other as Newton would say. They have an orbital uh, direction because of the vertex okay. creates an orbit which is proportional the distance, the orbital distance proportional of the inverse square law from the center. Okay. That gives that gives the solar system a system what it is. Okay. What it is.